In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Luke chapter 14 and verse 27. It was a memorable day in the life of the disciple Luke. He remembered that large crowds were following Jesus and they were caught up in the excitement of his new movement. Though they were caught up in this excitement, none of them were, not pers none of them were personally committed or involved in any way, however. Much of their enthusiasm was superficial and Jesus knew this. See, he knows when we are pretending. And so he was not and is not looking for superficial commitment or a crowd of tag-alongs. Jesus did not want the crowd to follow him blindly or on a wave of irresponsible emotion. No, he wanted wholehearted commitment. And so he invited the crowd and by extension all of us to think seriously and critically about what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. For just like it is prudent and wise to consider the cost involved in building a tower or going to war before jumping in with both feet, so it is necessary to take into account the cost and the commitment necessary to follow Jesus. Why did Jesus turn to the crowd and challenge them? Because it is hard to be a Christian sometimes. True? Is it hard to be a Christian at times? Do you find it hard to follow God at times? Well, if none of you want to admit it, I do. Because it is hard. Many people think that Christianity is a soft and comfortable religion for weaklings. A convenient escape from the tough realities of life. No, quite the contrary. See, Christianity does not necessarily smooth out all the bumps and bruises of life, nor necessarily grants us the material blessings and the healings that we often see sensationalized in the media. No, being a Christian can be downright hard at times. Hard to hold on to faith in God when life goes awry, when you find yourself down and out, when family is dysfunctional, when you're not getting the healing that you so long and desire, when your family is challenged by financial crises, it's hard to hold on to the faith sometimes when you see your children going astray and there's nothing you can do, when you see loved ones being hurt and there's nothing you can do, it's hard to hold on to the faith. It is. And that's part of the challenge of being a Christian, as we discover in the epistle today. In the epistle for today, for example, Onesimus, a runaway slave, was encouraged to return to his master Philemon, who owned him, because Onesimus had run away. And so now Paul was encouraging Onesimus to go back and to do the right thing. If you are a Christian, you should not have run away. You need to go back and ask permission to leave. How hard would that be? Knowing that if you return, you could be killed. At the same time, Paul was appealing to Philemon as a fellow Christian to go against society and put aside societal norms to forgive this runaway slave, to accept him and to show mercy and grace hard to go against society, but Paul asked it of him. Yes, dear friends, Christianity requires us to make some hard decisions at times, some decisions that we don't like, some decisions that does not necessarily make us feel good. It can be difficult, and that is very clear in the gospel reading today. See, in that passage from Luke, Jesus laid down three tough conditions for what it means to be a Christian. Three demands that if unmet, we cannot be his disciples. 
What are these three conditions? Well, first, he said that to be a disciple, we must be willing to renounce family. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Now, I've encountered some people in church at times who love hearing this because it's a great excuse not to talk to some family members. Someone said, I can't talk to you and I must hate you if I'm ready to follow Jesus. That's what the scriptures say. Is it really? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. It's unthinkable to think that we should treat others that way when we consider God's message of love. Love even your enemies. So what is Jesus saying? Well, the word hate does not refer to an emotional feeling, but rather a level of commitment. It is a hyperbole, an exaggeration, so to speak, similar to what we might say, and no offense to people, he says, that man is as big as a house. Now, we know literally a person cannot be as big as a house, but we're using it as an exaggeration to make the point. So, Jesus used the term hate to make his point. See, because in Jewish culture, the word hate was used to express a lesser love. So Jesus was saying that we must love him much more than we love even our closest family and friends. Why? Because to be his disciple, you may have to let go of close ties between family members if they themselves are not disciples. Because people who are not disciples of Christ will not always appreciate the love and devotion we have to and for God. See, no friend, no family member should keep us from serving Jesus. And that's essentially what he's saying. Our commitment must be as such that we choose Jesus above family, Jesus above friends, Jesus above culture, Jesus above life. Are we prepared to do that? No, we cannot neglect our family, but we should neither use family as an excuse for not following Jesus. See, when the man who wished to bury his father so that he could follow Jesus, Jesus gave him this reply, let the dead bury the dead. In other words, we must be committed to him above even our own lives our own desires, our own careers, our own interests, our own needs. Here's what Paul said about this commitment. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Jesus must be first in our priorities. Otherwise, we cannot be his disciple. Is that true in your life? Is it true in my life? It's something for us to think about. So there we have it. The first condition is that we must be willing to renounce family. The second condition to be a disciple is our willingness to carry our cross. How willing are we to carry the cross of Christ? You know well that the cross was a cruel form of punishment used by the Romans. The criminal was forced to carry his cross to the place of execution. And while carrying that cross along the way, lined up and down the streets, were a multitude of onlookers laughing, scoffing, mocking, cursing, spitting at the person to be executed, throwing rocks, condemning them as well. Everyone knew that this person was ultimately saying goodbye to life. There was no turning back. And so Jesus uses this vivid illustration of carrying our cross with the intent of showing us that following him requires that kind of saying goodbye to our own will and our desires because of our commitment to him. He used that illustration to say that sometimes when we are following Christ, people will laugh at us. When we want to do the right thing, when we want to stand up for God, people will scoff. People will condemn us. People will shun us for wanting to do the right thing. And so, dear friends, Bearing our cross is about our willingness to die to self. Now, growing up, I often heard people use the term when referring to some of their challenging children. This is my cross in life, right? You've heard that term before. 
Some of you, I don't know if you use it for your children. Don't let me know right now. Talk to me after the service. But we refer to our problems as this is my cross to bear. This is my challenge in life. Well, really, that's not the cross. That's the challenge. The cross that Jesus is talking about is our deliberate sacrifice, a willingness to be ridiculed and disliked by others in order to follow Jesus. It means doing what is right in God's sight, even when no one is looking, even when others hate you for doing it. The true follower of Christ is willing to bear it all. How willing are we then to stand up for Jesus? How willing are we to bear the cross? Are we willing to drink the cup from which he drinks? So that's the second condition. We must bear our cross. And the third and final condition he lays down in today's gospel is that we must give up all our possessions. You cannot be my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. And when I read this last week, I thought, yes, awesome. I'm going to ask the congregation when they come up for communion to bring all of their pocketbooks all of their jewelry, all of the deeds to their houses, because this is the Christian thing to do. So come on, you can give up all of your possessions, right? Is that what Jesus really is asking of us? No. What he's talking about, dear friends, is that we must have an inner attitude in which we are committed to Christ and not to the things of the earth. Remember what he tells us in Matthew's gospel, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust decay, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust decays. Jesus was really referring to an inner attitude toward life and material things. He meant that we ought to develop an inner detachment to material things so that they never enslave us, so that we do not become covetous or filled with Read. I was having dinner with a friend this past Friday evening, and this very point was made in our conversation. She was telling me about a few weeks ago when they had that flood, when we had the flood in Ellicott City. Of course, this is her place of business. And amidst the flood, she lost everything. Everything was washed away in her business. How devastating. Of course, they did not allow them to get in right away. But interestingly, there were just a few items that were saved. And despite the downpour of water from the ceiling and throughout the building, the only thing that was saved was her server with all of her business information on it. Computers were washed away, but the server stood strong. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. But before she discovered that, she said it was devastating because she didn't know what to think. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know where to go. It was hard. And like most of us in the midst of her challenges, she began to cry out, why, why? Until she spoke with a friend who said, you know what? How about instead of saying, why is this happening to me? Think of it as happening for me. She had always wanted to go in a new direction with her business. She was recently contemplating about moving in the next direction, but she was very hesitant. And not to say that God sent that flood, but certainly he used the flood, I told her, as a cleansing period and to kind of push her into the direction that he would want her to go. Sometimes when we look at life through those lenses, it makes challenges a little more digestible. The point I am making, because she said to me in the midst of that conversation, there's one thing I learned, Mario, is that life is too short to hold on to these material things. In a matter of moments, I thought everything I had was gone. That's how it is sometimes. When life hits us, we feel as though we've lost everything. But like that server that kept all of her business information, know that we still have one that 
remains connected no matter how difficult life gets. That's Jesus Christ. So what Jesus is saying to us is let go. Holding on to something that's enslaving you, let go. Because when we hold on to material possessions and they take such a priority in our lives, we become consumed with worry, we become extremely anxious, and we find it hard to live in the present and to trust God. It's an attitude of letting go and letting God. Turn to the person next to you and say, let go and let God. Don't sound like you all want to let go. <laughs> let go and let God. Yes. See, as Christians, that should be our approach to life. Our concern should be the poor, the hungry, and the homeless. That's what we should be known for, not holding on to material possessions. We should be known for our simplicity, generosity, and contentment. But that's hard. It's challenging because we live in a culture that has learned how to use people and love things. The philosophy of Jesus is, we love people and use things. The gospel is challenging today. It was challenging for me because it requires that we constantly assess our priorities in following Jesus. It costs to be a Christian. Yes, it does. And it costs a lot sometimes. It is a cost that may be paid in all types of currencies. For some people, that currency is a redirection of time and energy. For others, it's a change in personal relationships, a change in jobs, vocation, a commitment of financial resources, setting boundaries with family members or children. But for each of us, know this, that the cost is consuming, all consuming. We just sang that beautiful hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. It ends with these two lines, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Following Jesus demands our all. And that's hard. And he wants to know if you've counted the cost. As you find yourself challenged today, know this. There was one who carried an even greater cost. And he was successful. And now that we have that person who's Jesus Christ, know that he is there with us every step of the way, enabling us, empowering us, encouraging us to carry our own cross. We are never alone, no matter how it seems. For he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Bearing that in mind, I encourage you to join me, no matter how difficult it gets, to follow Jesus. Here's what Martin Luther, that great theologian said, a religion that gives nothing, that costs nothing, that suffers nothing, is worth nothing. Our religion is worth something. Would you follow him? Amen.